IBESS, Ecosystems and Ecology 2, Part 2, begins our study of community ecology. Community ecology examines groups of populations living and interacting in a common habitat. This movie will have its focus on competition for resource among different populations. Here's the outline for Ecosystems and Ecology, Topic 2 in the IBESS syllabus. Use this outline to find the part that you need. This movie has its focus here, and we'll start with some definitions. In this photograph, we have a desert biome ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community of different species interacting with one another and with the chemical and physical factors making up their non-living environment. Different plant species interacting with primary consumers and primary consumers interacting with secondary consumers and all species interacting with the abiotic factors of high insulation, low precipitation, and widely fluctuating temperatures. I've chosen this image to emphasize the physical abiotic factors in an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community and the physical environment with which it interacts. In this photograph of a grassland, a savanna biome, we have grass species, different species, interacting with the numerous species of grazers. The community interacts with the physical environment, the long dry summers and cool wet winters, and regular fire. A species is defined as organisms with shared characteristics which can and do interbreed in nature to produce viable offspring. The production of viable offspring is an important part of the definition. In this image, we have swans of the genus Cygnus. Here we have a population of pan paniscus, bonobo chimps, as a single species, an interbreeding group of organisms with shared characteristics producing viable offspring. Pan paniscus lives in the equatorial rainforests of Central Africa. This is their habitat as the environment in which a species normally lives. Here is a population of elephants. A population is a group of individuals of the same species which live in a defined region close enough to have interbreeding. In this photograph, we can see African elephants, Loxodonta africana, living in a defined area, their savanna habitat of eastern Africa, the environment in which the African elephant normally lives. Here is a population of killer whales, or sinus orca, in the open ocean biome. Again, a population of orca whales as a group of individuals of the same species, which live in a defined region close enough to be interbreeding. And that brings us to community, populations of all species, different species, living and interacting in a defined area, a common habitat. In this photograph, you can see different species interacting in a common habitat, producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, scavengers, and don't forget the decomposers. This is a community. A community, populations of all species, different species, living and interacting in a defined area, a common habitat. In Ecosystems in Ecology 2, Part 2, the focus is on community ecology. I've just run through some terms and definitions, and now we're on to the interactions, the relationships among species. The rest of this movie will focus on competition. And to do that, I will need to introduce you to the term and concept of the niche. Movies to follow will examine these topics. Use this outline to organize yourself. Here's an IB syllabus statement with the expectation that you be able to define the term species, population, community, ecosystem, and habitat with reference to local examples. As well, you need to be able to define the term niche. Before discussing competition, we must understand the concept of a niche. Here's a more detailed outline of interactions among populations in a community. This movie will focus on competition within a population or between two different species, two different but closely related species. Before looking at the detail of competition, as I've already mentioned, I will need to introduce you to the term and concept of the niche. Stay tuned. So you need to be able to define the term competition. It's a common demand by two or more organisms upon a limited supply of resource, for example, food, water, light, space, mates, or nesting sites. Competition may be intra-specific among individuals of the same species or inter-specific 
among individuals of different species, though usually the different species would be closely related. In this photograph, there are two individuals of the same species competing for resources. In this case, the resource is females with which these males could mate. This is intraspecific competition as the two individuals are from the same species. Here again is intraspecific competition, competition within a species for food, territory, nest sites, mates, possibly competition to escape predators. Competition in a community involves all species, even producers. What do producers compete for? Of course, producers compete for light, soil nutrients, and water. In this photograph of a rainforest, we probably have both intraspecific competition and interspecific competition. Competition for light, soil nutrients, and soil water. These gulls would experience intraspecific competition for nest sites on a cliff face. Competition for nest sites, not for the football. Here we can see intraspecific competition between two male hippos for females with which to mate. Competition is most intense when resources are limited or in short supply. Competition is defined as a common demand by two or more organisms upon a limited supply of resource. The zebras in this image compete with each other for food, but only if the food supply is limited, which it appears to be not in this image. In this season, there is enough for all the zebra in the population, such that intraspecific competition is not very intense. Interspecific competition is competition between two different species, like the wolf or the coyote. But if there's going to be interspecific competition, the two species must be closely related. Why? Because in order to compete, their role in the food chain would have to be very, very similar. And because their roles as consumers are very, very similar, this brings us to the term niche. So here are the next set of IB syllabus statements that will carry us to the end of this movie. Define the term niche with reference to local examples. Define fundamental niche and realized niche. Distinguish the fundamental niche from the realized niche with reference to an example. So here are definitions of the term niche. A niche describes the particular set of abiotic and biotic conditions and resources to which an organism of a population responds. The role, the niche is the role of a species in an ecosystem, including all physical, chemical, and biological conditions needed to live and reproduce. The niche is the job, the role of an organism, not its address, not its habitat. So, are the coyote and the wolf occupying the same niche? Are they in direct competition? How about a lion and a hyena? I'll be trying to answer these questions in the slides to follow. In this image, we see hyena and lion apparently in competition over a kill. But hyenas and lions do not occupy the same niche, thus these two species are not in direct competition. The lion and hyena have different roles in the ecosystem. Lions are predatory carnivores, they hunt and kill prey. Hyenas tend to be more scavenger, they feed on what's left over after the lions have killed. I suppose if many hyenas gang up on a lion after a fresh kill, there could be a brief moment of competition, but generally, these two species each occupies a different niche. It makes sense that the lion and hyena are not direct competitors. They are not so closely related as the hyena is in the dog family and the lion is in the cat family. But what about these two species, both cats, and their role is quite similar as predators on the East African plain. So I ask the questions, can two different but closely related species compete for the same resources, in other words, can two species occupy the same niche over an extended period of time, over evolutionary time? Do the lion and the cheetah, both in the cat family, compete directly with each other for the same resources? So before I address the question as to whether two different but closely related species can occupy the same niche over an extended period of time, we must look more carefully at the term niche. Think of niche as the way in which the species gains resources optimally. The role of a species is defined by optimal resource gathering. This graph shows resource use across niche dimension, space in which the species experiences the chemical, physical, and biological factors of the ecosystem. And at this point in the ecosystem, the species gains resources optimally with respect to 
the dimension of the niche. Its niche in the ecosystem is here. This organism gains its resources optimally at this point in the dimension of its niche. Remember, niche is best thought of as resource use in the ecosystem, the role of the species in the, e in the ecosystem, not its habitat. In an ecosystem, a species is successful in its niche if it is gathering resources at an optimal level. As we look at this curve, we can see resource use across some environmental gradient. At this point in the ecosystem, the biological and physical factors are optimal for resource use. But the species would be put under stress if resources were less available at either end of its niche. If resource availability is, is high, then the species will be in abundance, playing its role, occupying its niche. But if you imagine changing the ecosystem or imagine change across space as resources become more limiting, the species would struggle or would become absent or few in numbers. A niche describes the particular set of abiotic and biotic conditions and resources to which an organism or population responds. So you must think clearly and broadly when considering the role of a species in an ecosystem. It's easy to imagine the role of a predator or the role of a primary consumer, but what about the niche of plants? In this image, we have niche defined by abiotic factors, a specific temperature, and pH. Here is a niche defined by three abiotic factors, temperature, pH, and humidity. At the edges of the niche, or in a changing environment, the abiotic or biotic conditions to which a species responds may not be optimal. These conditions would put pressure on the species. The species may struggle, numbers may be low, or natural selection might force adaptations in the population to be better suited to the environment as it is. On the left, I've tried to draw a niche of three dimensions, displaying optimal abiotic and biotic conditions that allow this optimal resource gathering. On the right, I've drawn the three-dimensional niche of two species in red and green, and the two niches overlap just a bit, indicating competition for resources, interspecific competition. So I've come back to this question. Can two different species, closely related species, occupy the same niche over an extended period of time? In this diagram, the, the niche of species red and species green overlaps completely. Direct and intense competition. Can two species occupy the same niche as would be implied by species red and green? By the way, the niches of species red and green overlap partially with that of blue. Competition of either red or green species with blue would simply be less. The first piece of evidence addressing the question as to whether two different species can occupy the same niche over an extended period of time comes from an experiment in the 1970s by Joseph Connell, who studied two species of barnacle. Connell noticed that Thamalus occupied the upper, drier regions of a tidal coastline, while Balanus occupied the lower, wetter regions of the tidal coastline. Connell conducted two experiments. First, he selected an area and excluded Balanus. In other words, Connell removed Balanus and excluded Balanus. Secondly, Connell selected an area and removed Thamalus. He excluded Thamalus. In the first experiment, where Balanus was excluded, the Thamalus population expanded, ultimately occupying lower and upper reaches of the tidal region. Connell concluded that Thamalus was limited by Balanus, that in the presence of Balanus, a bigger species, by the way, Balanus outcompeted Thamalus. Thamalus was limited by a biotic factor, a larger, more competitive Balanus. In the second experiment, where Thamalus was excluded, Balanus population did not expand. Balanus remained in the same tidal region regardless of the absence of Thamalus. Connell concluded that Balanus was limited by abiotic factors, probably water availability. The two species compete, but their niches do not completely overlap. Over time, the populations have evolved to reduce direct competition. 
McConnell divided the term niche into two parts, fundamental and realized. The fundamental niche of the malice was the entire range of the tidal region. The fundamental niche is the full range of conditions and resources in which a species could survive and reproduce. But the realized niche of the malice was more restricted due to Balanus. The realized niche describes the actual conditions and resource in which a species exists due to biotic interactions. Now, the fundamental niche of Balanus is the lower, wetter region of the tidal coastline, and its realized niche is the same, as the malice is too small to cause interference. The niche of Balanus is determined by abiotic factors. So here are IB syllabus statements that you've seen before, just to remind you, and I'll let you read this slide on your own, but I ask, could you at this point define fundamental niche and realized niche? Could you distinguish the fundamental niche from the realized with reference to an example? So here are the definitions for fundamental and realized niche in case you didn't pick them up as I spoke through them on an earlier slide. The fundamental niche describes the full range of conditions and resources in which a species could survive and reproduce. The realized niche describes the actual conditions and resources in which a species exists due to biotic interactions. Review this slide to gain full control of fundamental and realized niche. Keep in mind that both abiotic and biotic conditions are important in defining the niche of a species. The realized niche of thamalis is smaller than the fundamental niche because of biotic factors, while the realized niche of balanus is the fundamental niche because it's a large competitive animal and limited by the abiotic factors above a certain point on the tidal coastline. As I've repeatedly asked the question about whether or not two closely related species could occupy the same niche, I've been angling at the competitive exclusion principle, which states that two species cannot occupy the same niche for an extended period of time. Given enough time, one species will outcompete the other for resources. In order to survive extreme competition, one of the two species, probably the less competitive one, might evolve, becoming adapted to new conditions, conditions at the edges of the niche, environmental conditions that initially did not favor the species. But by natural selection, the population's genetics change, becoming better and better adapted to the difficult conditions at the edges of the niche. Over evolutionary time, the niches of the two species separate, and with enough time, the two species would certainly not occupy the same niche, such that there would be little competition for resources. In a last example of competitive exclusion, we have the example of two paramecium species. When grown separately, paramecium caudatum in blue and paramecium aurelia in red display classic S-shape growth curves, with populations reaching steady-state equilibrium around carrying capacity. But when grown together, Paramecium caudatum numbers decline after day four, while Aurelia numbers climb to carrying capacity. Competitive exclusion. Two species cannot occupy the same niche for an extended period of time. In the late 1950s, an ecologist, Robert H. MacArthur, studied warblers in North American spruce trees. Upon a superficial examination of the ecosystem, MacArthur thought he may have discovered many warbler species occupying the same niche. But with careful study and detailed quantitative analysis of bird position, MacArthur realized the five species of warblers partitioned the resource, thus reducing competition. Some species spent time feeding in this portion of the tree, while others here and others here and others here. This is called resource partitioning. So let's come back to the two earlier examples of possible competition, the lion and the cheetah, and the coyote and the wolf, and ask the question, what's the thinking here? Do the lion and cheetah occupy the same niche? Do the coyote and wolf occupy the same niche? The lion and cheetah probably do compete for some resources, but it appears that the cheetah feeds mostly on Thompson's gazelle and feeds during the day, unlike the lion. The wolf and coyote probably could compete for some resources, but the coyote is more of an opportunist, part scavenger, part predator, and it mostly avoids the territory of the wolf. Competition has the potential to reduce the success of a species in its habitat. 
Thus, mechanisms to reduce competition, to reduce niche overlap, would benefit species over evolutionary time. Reduced competition can occur through specialized feeding habits, changing location within the habitat, or evolving through natural, natural selection to shift the niche. We will study the mechanism of natural selection later in this course. And that brings us to the end of IBESS Ecosystems in Ecology 2, Part 2. Moving on to Part 3, we will look at herbivory, predator-prey, and symbiotic interactions.